not academic footing. You're a, a journalist. You've had cause to report on this topic a couple of times, I believe. What exactly do we mean by security restructuring? So my, my understanding is that, first of all, um, Nigeria is a really big country. And uh, even though we hear that all the time, it's, diff it's, uh, it's hard to get a feel for just the sheer scale of what Nigeria is until you figure out that uh, with the military strength of about 250,000 people and total armed forces strength of just under 300,000 people, Nigeria is proportionally the least policed state on earth. It's the most under policed country on earth. And a lot of this problem stems from the fact that the security structure of Nigeria is very much centralized under the control of Abuja. So then we have the military, we have the police, the, uh, the state security services, the, uh, the civil defense forces. Everything is centrally run out of Abuja, out of the presidency and the federal government. Now, clearly, this is no longer working because the state of insecurity across the country. And let me quickly point out that when we talk about insecurity in Nigeria, it's no longer just a northern issue. It's now a pan-Nigerian okay. issue. There's, there's severe insecurity everywhere in the country. In every single zone in the country, there's a significant security threat. In the southwest, uh, maybe outside of Lagos, there's a threat of, uh, of, of abduction and kidnappings in rural areas and on the highways. Similar thing in the southeast and in Niger Delta, where there's the heightened threat uh, due to the activities of uh, the so-called Niger Delta militants. And then up north, there's a multiplicity of armed groups, some of whom we don't even know. So some of them, we just, we just call them Boko Haram, or we call them Herdsmen, or we call them this. Many of these armed groups, we don't even know. They're, they may be up to 10 different armed groups fighting across different parts of the north. So clearly, the centralization of power of, uh, of uh, defensive the defensive capacity in Nigeria is no longer working. So when we talk about decentralization of, of, of security in Nigeria and uh, restructuring of security, what my understanding of that is that we are simply saying that the current system of maintaining law and order in Nigeria is no longer working. We need a new paradigm. Now, as to what exactly that new paradigm is, there is a multiplicity of opinions. So some, some believe that uh, the, the solution lies in something called state policing, which you know I'm not so sure I personally agree with, but that's that's some people's point of view. Some believe in some kind of regional uh, self self policing efforts. Some believe that the, the federal government has a role to play in, in terms of uh, significantly expanding the numbers and the capacity of the armed forces as they are, which obviously has its own obvious uh, pitfalls in the sense that the financial capacity to pull that off may not exist right now. So restruct security restructuring, in my understanding, simply refers to the fact, simply alludes to the fact that the current security arrangement in Nigeria is not working. Uh, and there, there doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to, to look set to change anytime in the immediate future. So what that means is that we need to change fundamentally the way we examine, the way we carry out the, the process of, of maintaining security and law and order in Nigeria. Thank you very much, David, for that. And then I picked on something very crucial that you mentioned, which was the independence of the state to run uh, their policing efforts. Mr. Amakri, I'm also concerned about how equipped the states are to run the show, you know, independent of the center. I mean, the Nigerian Governors Forum just recently requested a security bailout from the federal government, which is being met with um, understandable apprehension given a similar bailout that was um, afforded them during the 2015 recession. Do you think that um, security can be adequately managed at this moment at subnational levels given their present um, constituted authority? Well, let me try and uh, situate the uh, situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, uh, for security is something that concerns every human being. In fact, we grew up, we grew up in our homes having a sense of security. Our parents protect us and of course, uh, as we're growing up, they don't let us go outside until we get to a particular age, then they let us out, we play in the yard, then from there, you can venture out further and further out. 
So you find out that security itself is, is something that you do by yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, when we try to define security in, the, in terms of the national uh, situation here, many people believe that security is police or SSS or RB or something like that. Security is actually us, you know, we. And um, some criminologists have even found, done some research where they found out that criminals don't commit crimes very far away from their homes. They commit crimes around their area. And uh, because uh, when they commit it, they need an escape route, and the escape route should lead them to a safe place, which is their homes. So um, policing naturally starts from the family. So we are the first security men for ourselves. And as things happen around us, we tend to, to see or hear about what is happening. If you grew up in the village, you will know. In the village, they will tell you they know all the thieves. They know all the good people. They know the good boys. They know the bad boys, you know, in town. And if somebody lost something, they will tell you, most likely, it is that boy that that's stole it, okay? So that's how security grew. Now we come to have government security, which is auxiliary, actually, because actually what government security is doing is to help us. But we are not feeling it because as organization grows, a lot of things start happening. We need the police to take care of us generally but when the police was formed in nigeria they were formed to protect the colonial masters and that was their job especially here in lagos that's where the police was formed in ikoi and at that time they were calling them a uh, house constabulary they were thinking about 18 or 16 of them and their job is to protect the colonialists against the wild Nigerians. And when they left, it was funny because when they left, they they didn't change their orientation to know that now it is Nigerians that are the Ogas. They said, yes, Nigerians are now the Ogas, so we'll do what we do to the Oibo Ogas. So they started protecting the Oibo people against the public. So the Nigerian guy has not been able to have the benefit of police service. Uh, they are busy uh, running around with the orgas in their convoys and putting their sirens and beating everybody to clear away from the road and take them away. You know, so that's a phrase that the police is your friend does not exist here in Nigeria because they are not for us. They mm. are to protect the political class. And, mostly, and I have to jump, because, allow me to jump, allow me to jump in there, Mr. Amakin. Yeah. So please. we've established that there's a sort of um, us versus them mentality. David, and yes. um, you agree with me here that this is something that has fueled that recurring rhetoric of um, how does this, uh, the security apparatus that we've established, this so-called, this infrastructure, right? How does it translate yeah. to actual value of human life and security for everyday Nigerians? Some people would argue yes. that we have entered a constructive state of emergency, which we have just not yet acknowledged. What has gone wrong with security in Nigeria, do you think, and, and how exactly did we get here? So, I agree um, with you. Because when we start to, when we start Mr. to, I'm, okay. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to jump in. I would like oh, okay. David to, to give us a take oh, okay, up okay. on that, I'm and sorry, then we'll, sorry, we'll, we'll come right I'm back sorry, to you. Please. No, it's fine. Go it's ahead. <laughs> so um, now, obviously, I'm not uh, the expert on this that Mr. That Mr. Matri is, but I'll I'll try my best uh, to answer this question based on my understanding. Now, from my understanding, two significant things that have gone wrong with the Nigerian policing and with um, the Nigerian security sector as a whole. Uh, first of all, 
uh, a doctrinal issue, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. And the second is an economic issue. Now, what I mean by a doctrinal issue is that uh, the the doctrine, as as uh, my co-panelist uh, alluded to, the initial purpose of the Nigerian police force when it was formed was to protect uh, a group of colonials, not necessarily to protect ordinary you know, Nigerians. And unfortunately, uh, post-independence, the sort of reorientation that was supposed to happen both within the police and the military, which is also very important, did not happen. So unfortunately, the, the idea has been perpetrated over the decades, long before Nigeria's independence and even post-independence, that wearing a uniform somehow makes you superior to a regular person on the streets, to a civilian. So, and you can trace this back to even the, the events which sort of started Nigeria down the course of you know, making several horrible mistakes. Like the January, the January 1966 coup, if you read the different accounts from the different people who were involved, Something that always jumps out at you is the honest the realization that every single one of these 20 something, 30 something, 30 something year old young men believe that they were superior to everyone else because they were in the military, because they were all uniform, because that's that's what they were taught. Right? They were all sent to Sandhurst and all these other places. And that was the orientation, that was the doctrine that was taught to them that you are better than your countrymen because you wear you wear a uniform. So you are therefore entitled to dictate how your country runs, which obviously is not the case because holding a gun and wearing a uniform does not <laughs> qualify you in any way to run a country. And that same spirit uh, filters through every type of uniformed uh, uh, agency in Nigeria. If you look at them, the military, the police, the DSA, it's the same mentality that I'm not a civilian, I wear a uniform, I hold a gun, I have a rank, therefore I'm better than you, you can't talk to me. And unfortunately, over the decades of, of uh, military dictatorship, this mindset has been heavily calcified into the Nigerian mindset that it's very, very difficult to reprogram and let go. So even 21 years after the return of democracy, we're still struggling with shaking off that problematic mindset. Now, the second uh, problem, from my understanding, is an economic problem. And what I mean by that is that, to put it very bluntly, uh, Nigeria cannot, can no longer afford to police itself. As I mentioned earlier, Nigeria is geographically a massive country, 993,000 square kilometers, over 3,000 kilometers of borders alone. Uh, and of that 3,000 kilometers of border, I, I think it's estimated Nigeria police is maybe about 600 kilometers worth of borders. Nigeria is a wide open space, completely unpoliced. It's a free for all. So if I was to ask you, for example, um, is there any record of you know, who comes in and goes out of Nigeria? Not really. Maybe at the airport there is, but you know, if you're coming in from the border in Niger or Chad or Cameroon or even Benin Republic, is there a record? How many people are in Nigeria? How many babies are born in Nigeria? Do we know? We, we, we just have estimates. And the reason for that is that the Nigerian state has a low capacity to run itself. There just isn't enough money for the Nigerian state to do the things that it needs to do. So which then creates this power vacuum that it, it, as, as someone very eloquently put it the other day, the Nigerian state no longer has a monopoly of violence, right? There are several different groups competing with the Nigerian state to enforce their will. And this isn't just your Boko Harams or your ISWAPs. You know, those, those groups exist. But elsewhere across the country, there are several groups which are basically competing with the Nigerian state to enforce their will. So even here in the Southwest, uh, where we tend to, the Southwest tends to think of itself as the most peaceful region in Nigeria, which to an extent, I suppose it is. But even here in the Southwest, we had, we had stroke, have something called uh, OPC, the Odua People's Congress. Now, on the ground, what the organization is, on the ground, a lot of the time, is a sort of paramilitary vigilante organization a lot of the time on the ground, which basically uh, steps into filling a gap that the Nigerian state does not exist in. That uh, uh, the, the community policing, if you will, maintaining security at a granular level, which oftentimes the Nigerian police state no longer has the capacity to, these little groups step in. So those, those things in, in themselves, you know, even though they are not like picking up a gun and you know, shooting at the, the Nigerian army, 
But just their existence alone is proof that the Nigerian state no longer has that monopoly of violence because it no longer has that, that state capacity to enforce its will. So from my understanding, it's a doctrinal problem, which, may, which is that the security forces have been indoctrinated over time to think of themselves as adversaries to civilians, as against uh, people who are supposed to protect and collaborate with civilians. And then secondly, that the Nigerian state can no longer run itself, it no longer has the, the money, the financial capacity to run itself, and which creates a power vacuum, which then leads to the insecurity that we are witnessing. So I would like to marry two, two parts of your conversation, the historical perspective from democracy, you know, to to the other um, challenges which you mentioned, Mr. Amakri. Uh, coincidentally, you um, you retired from the National uh, Security Service ab about um, on the onset of democracy in Nigeria uh, to go into industrial security. I mean, you had decades of experience in the security sector. Now, you know what is the precedent over time for outfits such as um, regional outfits such as Amoteko and you know the Vigilante Ojoa People's Congress, which uh, David mentioned in terms of their success factors, would you say that um, regional blocks and regional coordinated efforts are more successful than completely decentralized policing at the state levels? When you consider the fact that the states in these regions have similar cultures, their peoples have similar issues and you know um, share similar aspirations, would you say that this regional system of um, security policing has a solid precedent that is that is um, that is that could be successful. Anyway, the thing is that we don't have a precedent for community policing in the sense that uh, what the police brought before, you know, they brought this uh, PCRC, Police Community Relations Committee, and. Uh, that committee did not do a lot. Now they are trying to, the police, instead of balkanizing itself and allowing state police, local government sheriffs, even university police, they have decided to bring community policing because they know they don't want to let go of that unitary system. They want to maintain that unitary system. Now, we cannot say that it has worked before because we don't know um, how, it is, uh, how it has operated successfully. Even the Aboteco thing, I don't like the way they are uh, pursuing it because that is not what the community policing is supposed to be. The community's policy is supposed to be an intelligence-driven body, an intelligence-driven policing system where we are going to utilize hunters, artisans, vulcanizers, taxi drivers, you know, hotel uh, waiters, all kinds of people, right down with the people. If you travel overseas, sometimes you see all these taxi drivers, they will be asking you all kinds of questions. You know, uh, where are you coming from? Uh, Nigeria. Oh, how is Nigeria? Why are you here? You know, uh, do you like uh, this country? Uh, these all kinds of questions, leading questions that will collect a lot of information from you. And when they collect all this information, they report somewhere. And that is what our community policing is supposed to be. But instead, what we have here now, you saw what happened in Ondo State the other day. They are busy wearing uniforms, saluting, marching, and saluting. That is not community policing. Community policing is not supposed to be in uniform. They are like, okay, let me put it this way. They are supposed to be a bunch of, or an undercover, an undercover intelligence spies that are going to relate information and intelligence to the police. But all the same, you know, that's how we have arranged it. And 
I don't think it's going to work because that is not exactly what we are looking for when we say community policing. Okay, we have Leonard with us now. Uh, Leonard Ipuke, thank you. Thank you for joining us. So um, I'll, I'll come to Leonard shortly. Mr. Amaki, what I hear you saying is intelligence gathering. So would, would we say that, you know, the fundamental problem, what, what is wrong with the security mm -hmm. sector right now is a lapse, a gap in the intelligence gathering mechanism? Yes, it's intelligence failure. That's the problem we're having with our police system. Because police is, police is intelligence driven. You, you know, the, the days where you have policemen walking on the road and, you know, uh, looking for criminals and stuff like that, those are old days. The new system of policing is heavily computerized, heavily uh, uh, use of equipment, uh, sensing devices, drones that will give pre-knowledge a timely, actionable pre-information that the policeman will use. So instead of reacting to a criminal situation, you are preventing, and that's where police should be. And, you know, I, I don't like people saying that we don't have the body, because we do, we do, we have all the body. You know, uh, instead of giving the states the body, they came up with 31 billion already to give to uh, to do policy uh, community policing. So where was it before, you know? And then of course we are busy saying we don't have money, but uh, you you can hear people, you know, going to NDDC and carrying 81 billion one person alone. So I I believe we strongly have that money, but we really have to use it properly. So I'll come back to this point about, you know, digitization and intelligence gathering. But Leonard, uh, thank you once again for joining us. Um, one of the key pillars of the current administration, uh, one of the key priorities of their agenda was tackling the insecurity problem. Um, the president started with, you know, laudable initiatives like relocating the defense headquarters to the hotbed of the insurgency in the Northeast. But I mean, recently you were hearing clamors for the resignation of the service chiefs, driven in part by the National Assembly. Our security situation seems to be a case of um, repeating the same strategies and ineffective implementation of our extant policies. It begs the question, is that really a political will to tackle the insecurity menace? Um, once again, uh, uh, first of all, thanks for, for having me. Apologies for joining late. I, have a bit, I had a bit of tech issues, um, my internet source and all that. Okay. Um, the case with the Buhari administration is, um, is, almost, um, is almost unforgivable. I believe that um, there is a real call for history to not just indict them for deliberately allowing Nigerians to die, but for history to actually recognize them, uh, this administration particularly, as not just a failed administration from a security standpoint, but I think that a time will come in history where we will discover that there is some kind of economic um, objective that is eroding, that has made the government deliberately destroy almost everything that should have happened to bring the security situation to some level of uh, tolerance. I say this with a sense of, um, of responsibility and I, 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 I don't mind being quoted that if the subsisting situation is not benefiting a category of people, it would have ended. Now, it is not even a case of repeating past strategies. It is that 
the situation has, we have never been this bad before from a security standpoint. It has moved away from Boko Haram. Boko Haram is no more the big issue. Kidnapping is by far, by far the worst issue from a security point of view we have in Nigeria currently. And nobody is safe. From the average truck driver on the road to the big man in his mansion, everybody is a potential victim of kidnapping. That is how widespread it has become. That is how easy it has become to perpetrate these crimes and get away with it. And this government is responsible for bringing Nigeria to that point. We we're not there before. Apart from failing to deliver on Boko Haram, which to my view, they had all of the opportunities, all of the resources to deal with that situation. Uh, they deliberately didn't deal with it. They pumped a lot of money into it. The money didn't yield results, not because the money couldn't have yielded results, but because I believe that there is a setup to ensure that that enterprise remains a failure. Leonard, um, I would ask. I would ask that we we err on the side of um, caution. Um, this is a is, passionate is, argument. Uh, <laughs> this is a passionate passionate if, argument, if, if no doubt. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> if you if you if you want someone who will tone down the rhetoric, you'll probably mm -hmm. not have invited me to the show. But I Definitely, can present Leonard. based fact based evidence yeah. of my assertion. The security budget for this country is in hundreds of billions of Naira. If I were to give you hundreds of billions of Naira and the entire might of the armed forces, all 200,000 men and personnel, and the might of the police, all 300 to 400,000 men, to deal with the situation, a situation, say Boko Haram, for example, and over the course of five years, it grew from bad to worse. Over the course of five years, we added Fulani or nomadic headsmen or whatever you want to call them. Over the course of the period, we added different groups of armed banditry that didn't exist before. How do you expect me to account for that failure? I would simply say that you didn't use the money for the purpose or you had no competence. We cannot say Buhari does not have competence to deal with the security situation like Boko Haram. That's his job. That he grew to the rank of a general. My dad was a soldier. I respect that he should be an expert in dealing with that level of banditry. But he has failed woefully against people that are untrained. You know? So I have no reason to be diplomatic about the assertions that I make. I have lost people personally. I've negotiated kidnapping twice. So I, am, I, have, I have, I've been in situations where there are gun battles in my, to preserve my asset a number of times. So I do not even begin, so I'm not speaking theories. I've lost friends, people that are classmates that I know by name, that got slaughtered in their sleep when they went to visit their villages. This was not the case before this administration came into power. Some groups have been emboldened by the deliberate failure of this administration as if they had inside news that the administration wasn't going to be interested in chasing down this matter. And so they became emboldened. So before we come to the police and the role of the police in all of this, I, I, I have a lot of respect for the Nigerian police. That, that may sound surprising, but every time that I got results with security situation, it was the police that helped. They, 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 may, not be, they may not be motivated by, by the Nigerian system, but, Every single time that I've gone to them to make a passionate plea on account of a security situation and provided them the logistics to move around, they came through. What does that tell me? That this group has the capacity to come through when motivated. And if we have put sufficient oh, funding into um, that motivation process- Leonard, 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 let me jump in here. Um, David, so um, I hear you hear what um, Leonard is saying. Are you in are you in agreement that this is um, more of a lack of political which um, will, which stems from the visible body language of the administration, or is it failure of a broken system that needs fixing? What is it exactly? Because you know, in the past we've seen 
allegations exchanged between the ruling administration as well as um, opposing opposition parties about politicizing tragedy. However, like um, Leonard said, um, Nigeria has spent over six trillion naira on the security sector alone in the past five years. And in the 2020 approved budget, um, the combined national security allocation is about 17% uh, of the total budget. So um, what is it exactly? Where, where is the money going? And, you know, just share your thoughts. So I think it's a bit of both. I think what, what Leonard said is, is perfectly valid in that if you spend that much money on something, you need to show results. You, you know, normally in, in a normal setup, you cannot spend six trillion naira on defense to, you know, and then the, the security situation is worse. That simply makes no sense. So I would agree with, to an extent with what he said that there clearly, clearly is some, at least some level of, you know, political, uh, what's the word now? Uh, at the very least complacency, if not out outright compliance, if not outright uh, collaboration with whatever is going wrong. Because, I mean, it makes no sense if you look at it on, 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 a, on a numerical level, you cannot spend that amount of money and get no results whatsoever and, and actually move backward. That is, <laughs> that is uh, statistically impossible. So, but apart from the failure of the lack of political will to actually achieve results, there is actually a systemic failure that actually predates this administration or the last administration or any administration since the start, since the return of democracy, in fact. And it is the simple fact that uh, I think as, as uh, Mr. Macri uh, uh, alluded to briefly, that security actually goes beyond just wearing a uniform and pointing gun at things. Security is actually very, it's a, it's a, it's a personal thing almost, it's a very granular thing. Um, the, in the, the parts of the country where the security situation broke down first, which is like the northern part of the country, if you, if you draw the line back far enough, you will realize that the, this failure started decades ago. This failure started when some regions in the country were investing at least some of their, you know, their income, their money in education, for example. So in, in the Southwest, my dad always used to tell me that the reason he was able to have a future was that there was a free education policy. So he was able to go to school up to the age of 16 for free, and then he got a scholarship to go to university, and that was how he got the life that he had. Some parts of the country invested that kind of money in training the next generation. Some other parts of the country didn't. And some other parts of the country were, were okay with the way they were, and that was where the security failure started, because when you are expanding a population geometrically. I, I believe something like six babies, or is it five or six babies are born in Nigeria every minute, right? There's a geometric population expansion. There's a, there's a statistic that I saw the other day. The top, I believe was the top 10 most fertile countries on earth, and nine of them were in, were in uh, Northwestern Africa, between West and North Africa. Also the poorest countries in the world. So there was Nigeria, there was Niger, there was Chad, there was you know, the usual suspects. And when you are expanding your population geometrically and you are not making provisions for what that population will do when it, when it gets older, especially when you, and this is not, this is not uh, David's opinion, this is, a, this is a geographical fact, this is a scientific fact. Uh, wherever there's a large population of young men, young males who are unemployed, there is a security, there's already a security problem there. That's a, that's a geographical fact borne out by the data. So when you are expanding a population geometrically and there's no plan for what you want these people to do, there was no education, there's no vocational training, there was nothing in place for them. They were just supposed to just apparently just grow up and just find their way you know, inside a non-economy that another part of the country is. And that was where the security problem actually started from because then to sustain that population in the in very unsustainable manner that it had been expanded, the only option that there was was to sort of muscle the rest of the country and make sure that you know we fight those people, you know, focus the that society uh, externally, if you will, make sure that, that the political culture is externally focused on fighting an external enemy so that you can go and you know grab other people's thing and feed your people. But 
that only that only goes on for so long. Eventually, even the southern part of the country too is also experiencing geometric population expansion. So to cut a very long story short, <laughs> there are simply too many people in Nigeria and too little an economy. According to uh, World Bank estimates, we're anything from 180 to 210 million people in Nigeria. The Nigerian economy is worth about what, 450 what, billion US dollars. The, the Nigerian federal budget, as I, was, as I said on a different platform the other day, the Nigerian federal budget is roughly $20 billion a year. And that's for 210 million people, well, between 180 and 210 million people. The Egyptian federal budget for 2020 is the equivalent of 100 billion US dollars, 106 billion US dollars. Like Egypt has 100 million people. So Nigeria's budget evens out as about 111 million, sorry, 111 dollars and 11 cents per Nigerian per year. While Egypt's budget it, uh, works out roughly $1,000 per Egyptian per year. So <laughs> that you can already see where the security problem is. In case of the numbers, the numbers don't like. Exactly. The numbers are simply telling you that there's too, there's too many of you and your economy is too small. And when that happens, boom, that's, that's the only way that is. So unfortunately, the way it's looking, based on these like sort of a napkin arithmetic that I've laid out, unfortunately, it's going to get worse unless someone can come up with an economic solution and fast. Because even if you come up with a security solution, which is basically shooting everything into submission, unless you want to kill 20 or 30 odd million people, you are still going to have a problem five, ten years down the line. So, Mr. Amakri, um, kidnapping, banditry, persistent clashes in southern Kaduna, Zamfara, the upsurge in the insurgency in the northeast, farmer herder conflict in you know north central. So many things are wrong. It, it's obvious that we are an embattled nation. You know, we're battling several crises at the same time. And it would be foolhardy of us to consider these happenings as individual, as um, individual, um, individual happenings. There's obviously something tying it all together. I mean, what are we missing here? What is the connecting dot? Uh, first of all, can you hear me? Yes, I can. can. You hear me? Sorry. Oh, great. Okay because my uh, video has ceased. All right, so first of all, I want to make something very clear. You know, we have this terrorism, this surgency actually going on in the Northeast. And then uh, suddenly they started growing. Remember, these were boys that were in Medugri, you know, uh, demonstrating uh, with sticks, and bows and arrows, and then suddenly now they have started acquiring guns. And then, of course, they have grown to the extent whereby they pay allegiance to ISIS, and ISIS have also funded them. And uh, right now, they have, before they were trying to even get uh, some local governments in Nigeria. I wish I could show you a map, but I can't now. But, uh, they moved in from the Northeast into Nigeria. And then of course the military have been able to push them back. But one thing they are doing now, uh, somebody, I think it's David who was saying something about uh, bandits and uh, kidnappers and all kinds of people, you know. Let me give you a better picture of what is happening. Terrorism strive on two major things, one, publicity, two, logistics. So for their logistics, what they've done is that they have asked some of their boys to enter into Nigeria, either to engage in kidnapping for ransom, bank robbery, and drug, drug running. Now, these are how they make money to run their logistics because Many people don't think about it. How do they actually feed themselves? Where do they get the money? They are getting some support, but basically they also go out to make money. So when you get bandits coming into Nigeria, under the guise of uh, bandits and everything, I have said it in many places that these are the Boko Haram extension moving around in our country. 
Now, the problem we have here is that we have not been able to sit down and plan it because we always brush things aside. Remember the uh, General Anderson, who is the spokesman for Africa, the African command of the U.S. Army, came around and told us that, see, we have some terrorists who are trying to enter into Nigeria and if you go all the way down to the south. And the military spokesman, General Leche, came out and said that, no, that's old news. It's up to 10 years, five years old. And not quite one week after, we saw what happened in Mali. And if you go back in history, you'll find out that when these military coups start, they start from Mali. From Mali, they move to Burkina Faso. From Burkina Faso, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Ghana, Nigeria, Niger. That's how it works. Instead of us, we are too lackadaisical because we don't want to sit down and take this problem and dissect it. We don't want to dissect it and then find solutions to it. So this is basically what we are, what we are suffering right now. Leonard, so when we talk about national security in Nigeria, Leonard, are you with me? His mic is booted. Oh, okay. But I, Leonard, if you can hear me, there's a certain, you know, cloak and dagger secrecy sort of that surrounds um, security issues in Nigeria, um, you know, when we're talking about the security apparatus. And one um, intended or unintended consequence of this is a sort of public detachment from issues of um, national security leading to apathy towards that um, establishment. How do we thread that fine line between um, access to information and, you know, the proverbial classified in the interest of national security clause, you know, in a way that ensures active citizen participation in that, um, in that sector? I think, I think the citizens have participated actively enough. In fact, the citizenry has done more than they are. They are fresh uh, of whatever security that we enjoy is the security that we provide ourselves. If you go to every street in Lagos, they have a gate, they have their own in-house arrangements. Every village in Nigeria has some form of vigilante or the other, even before the new wave of let's do community policing. It's an indictment on the system. The Nigerian citizenry has lost um, hope in the state apparatus um, around providing security for we, we've been involved, we've been too involved. We have decided that we cannot trust what the government provides. Where it is available, it is inadequate, and oftentimes it is not available at all. And even in some cases, that availability is skewed in the favor of the elite of society. So the Nigerian people have long moved away from the definition of security apparatus to a more functional, more practical one for their own purpose, which is to do what I can to protect what I have and where I live. So um, it is the onus for me is on the, the security um, practitioners or the, the security, the people within the security field to show us that they can do the job. And like David tried to, try to, 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 to allude to, you, you can make all of the baseline economic drivers of insecurity in Nigeria. You can analyze that, put it in numbers as much as you like, but that number is not going to move an inch. You cannot solve the economic problem unless you control the, 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 the security situation. There has to be a measure of stability. That is a central liberal truth, that it is politics that can change a nation and deliver it from itself, that can change culture and deliver it from itself. The baseline intervention must come from the government of the day. And that baseline intervention must come in the form of stabilizing the situation, getting the situation to a semblance of control. How do you get from here to there? Is it empowering the community policing system that the people have come to trust? Because these people really trust their area boys. They trust their OPC. They trust their local vigilante. 
the, 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 the information gathering system in these local setups are very, very, very good. When somebody, when there is a theft, they don't question two people. They know exactly where to go. They know exactly who to talk to. Is it to strengthen this system, put some structure around it, provide some guidelines around it? Or is it to create regional ones like Amoteco and so on and so forth? The people have already started iterating these things by themselves. And it is left for the government to say, maybe I should strengthen what, what they have on ground. Maybe I should rejig the security system differently. Maybe I should decentralize the police like a lot of people are clamoring for. Uh, but if we don't do that first, and get the security situation to some semblance of stability. They, any economic intervention that we bring will not work. There is a lot of programs on agriculture now, but how do you go to, a farm, to the farm when there is kidnapping, when bandits will pick you up, when the, the, there is all sorts of armed robbery on the road to the farm? I am a farmer and I, I, the, 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 the week I resumed in my farm for two weeks, there was either a robbery, a murder or a kidnapping on that 20 kilometer stretch from Lukoja to the farm. You know, this is not on the news. So there is practical evidence that there has to be a measure of control before you even any economic intervention will come in. I also disagree with some of these um, historical context around which we, we try to um, analyze and interpret our current situation. For God's sake, I don't know anybody in the police force today that joined the, that, is, that was in the colonial police. None of them. Several generations have passed since that time. That architecture has changed many, many times. If you look at the police, there has been a, quite a number of structural changes in terms of some of the functional units of the police, like the SARS, like the special fraud unit, like, you know, all of that. There has been, you know, some evolution around how they go about policing over the years. And I do not think that they still carry the relic of the colonial system. What is wrong with the police is exactly what is wrong with our fiscal federal federalism, which is that all power, all money is centralized. And then every, all the federating units become rent taker from the center. It hasn't worked for us from the budgeting and development point of view. It would not work for us from the security point of view. But what can work? I believe that if you go to communities and you ask them what we work in this community, they have the answers in a blink of an eye. So the government needs to look to the people to decide what kind of security system can work for them and then to actively allow them, allow them to pursue those, those, those objectives and, and, and the government provides the funding. So um, it, 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 um, it, the, the topic is close to home. I, I have lost faith in the ability of the current government to make any improvement at all from this subsisting situation. I have lost absolute faith. First, we do not have any monies anymore to do any major economic intervention. For the next two, three years, I believe that we will survive if we are lucky, we will survive, stop at a recession, but I predict that we will hit a depression, even though they are going to try to hide it. Okay, global funding uh, financing will be constricted for uh, the, 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 the foreseeable future. The prognosis for oil is not very exciting. So we, our, our, our vista for intervention will remain limited over the, the, the three years going forward. So what should we then do? I think that the government should empower the citizenry. It is not a conspiracy theory that uh, we, should, we don't trust the police, they don't trust us. It is a fact that on our roads every day, in the bushes, in local communities where they don't have money, in fact, the safest places are even the highbrow areas. That's ridiculous, isn't it? You would expect that it is where money is that people should go to, to rob, but no. Cultism, I forgot to add that element. It is after kidnapping, cult activity is the second most dangerous security situation in this country. And I just came back from Asaba a couple of days ago. There is a, a major cult war happening there. The entire town from Asaba to Ogeli to Kuala, burning, literally, young boys chasing themselves in the street with guns, as if the police as if the security apparatus is no more functioning. 
villagers too scared to provide the intel required to get these boys um, 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 caught or rehabilitated or whatever. Why are they around unemployment and all of that, right? But to even deal with the unemployment, you would have to suppress the cultism. You have to restore some level of control. And this is what I do not think the current government can do. Communities can be empowered to do that. Did you guys hear any of that? So I've been talking yeah, to myself. Yeah, you, yeah, we did. But it seems like Khadija's feet has frozen. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, would you? I think it's uh, Adija has frozen. Yeah, so I think there's a problem with that. Well, let, let me just, yeah. let me ask and just continue the conversation from where Leonard stopped and um, maybe go to Mr. Dennis. I mean, we'll just ask very clearly. Um, since January to date, we've had thousands of people die um, across the country. What can we do? I mean, what's the solution to our security crisis? Sir? Um, David had mentioned funding and how that in Egypt, for example, they spend about $1,000 per citizen per year. Nigeria spends about 100 and something dollars. Is pumping more money into our security going to stop the killings or make things a lot better? What can we do to change things? Mr. Dennis. Oh, it's for me? OK. Yes. Well, the thing is this. We are not going to run a country by throwing money at problems. Because I think that's what uh, they've tried to do. Uh, even uh, in the Northeast, they, they, you know, they call them when they are, when they are having a, a down time. The Senate will call them and then how much you need, they give them the money and then they go out. And uh, they spend it with no results because the KPIs, you know, the key performance indicators are not, are not encouraging at all. And uh, when they finish it, they come back again. What does that tell us? Bad management. There is a serious bad management going on. And uh, we continue spending money. Uh, one thing I know is that uh, when, you, when you compare it to other countries, for instance, last year, uh, in the global defense budget uh, mm -hmm. per country, Nigeria spent about $2 billion on defense. That is insignificant. Because when you look at Angola, Angola spent $7 billion, And they are smaller than us. We produce more oil than them. You know? And they are more efficient. They, they can spend more money and do what they want to do. So what is the problem with us? Corruption? I think that runs through our blood, uh, our bloodstream, you know, where people are not even managing the money they are having properly. Uh, we are not buying the things like uh, we ordered for tokados. Uh, and uh, the money we spent for them is almost triple what another country spent for it. So what are we doing? What are the accountability issues that we have to face? Because like I said, it is not that we don't have money, but it's because we either misuse it or we are not honest in dealing with ourselves as Nigerians. We can't hear you, Khadija. Khadija, I believe yeah, you're can you hear We can't hear you. I think your mic has an issue. Hey, yep. She's not muted. It's a mic. Okay. No, we can't hear you still. Why are you trying to sort that out? Let me let me just ask David straight up. So Mr. Dennis is saying that we need to deal with um, the gaps in corruption, for example. Do you think, what would you say about that? Is that the solution? Would you think that's the solution as well? 
dealing with the gaps, corruption, for example? Mm, it's, it's one of the solutions. As, as you mentioned, the deal to buy the uh, Super Tocano jet was heavily inflated. And for whatever reason, that just didn't get the airplane that it should have got. So yes, there clearly is something to be said for plugging the gaps. Because in terms of, in, in terms of defense procurement, for the amount of money Nigeria has spent, even though it's not that great, but for the amount of money it has spent, which is still significant, the actual uh, procurement that has been done is not enough. I remember uh, under Dr. Jonathan, I think I believe it was was it one billion or two billion dollars that was pulled out of the uh, was it the sovereign wealth fund or the excess credit account? One of them uh, as an emergency, you know, uh, procurement fund to fight Boko Haram and. Nobody can actually say what that money purchased, like what results did that procurement fund achieve? And this is a like this is a this is an ongoing problem with the Nigerian military that dates back to even the days of military rule. That you know, even when an administration exists that is willing, that has a political will to invest in military procurement, what 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 could the, the amount of money that could buy a squadron of fighter jets could buy three instead? And nobody ever asked those questions. So yeah, it is a definite cause. That inefficiency is, is a definite problem. But I still, I still go back to the point that we, we often because we 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 have this thing in Nigeria that we do where we hear so and so billion in the news, so and so million, so and so billion. This person stole forty billion. That that that, and that gives us the false impression that oh, there's just these fantastic sums of money flying around somewhere in Nigeria and that people are just pocketing huge sums of money and therefore that means that there's money in Nigeria. Statistically there isn't. What is happening is that the little money that there is is being stolen. But even if Nigeria was run at 100% efficiency, it still wouldn't be enough. The economy is simply too small and I realize that this is a, this isn't something that people like to hear. You know, people love love to fight with this whenever I say it. But that's the fact. If Nigeria was run at 100% efficiency, if crude oil was $150 per barrel, if you could account for every single penny, Nigeria would still be very poor, and Nigeria would still be struggling to keep a handle on itself. That is the reality. It's at the end of the day, it boils down to, to to geography and it boils down to economics. That we we don't like to have these conversations because then you, it leads to some very uncomfortable conversations about things like oh, our, our birth rate, which people get very defensive and very quickly about. If you say that Nigeria's population expansion rate, Nigeria's geometric expansion, about roughly five children per woman on average, five, uh, five, yeah, five children per woman is too much. And I wish we're trying to get that down to like the level of Tunisia, which is about two or three children per woman. People get very defensive about that. People don't want to hear that, both in the North and in the South. Nigerians get very defensive when you say that we have a population problem. Now we should be trying to get a handle on our population growth. And so, you know, but be that as it may, the fact is that the numbers don't lie. Nigeria's economy is too small. There is not enough money in circulation in Nigeria. There simply isn't for 180 million people. The, and how, how you know this is when, as, as, as I did earlier, you do the, the, the per capita calculation and compare it not with developed countries, but with our neighbors. With, fellow developing countries, compare us with, with Ghana, compare us with Egypt, compare us with Tunisia, compare us with, I won't even go, even go as far as South Africa, Mozambique, Angola. And you'll find out that proportionally, we are much poorer than they are. We have a bigger economy in absolute terms, but that's, it's the same way a, a Molue is bigger than a Toyota Corolla. But if you, had to give, if you had to give someone the choice between having a Molue and having a Toyota Corolla, I think you'd choose the Corolla. And Nigeria is that Molue. Proportionally, uh, on a per capita basis, we are much poorer <laughs> than we are aware of. So I think a lot of us have that mistaken assumption that Nigeria is rich, but that Nigeria has some money somewhere that if only it was channeled properly, that everything would be good. That is not the case. Obviously, the money that Nigeria does have is not being utilized properly. It can't be accounted for as it currently is. And every time someone has made an attempt to try and hold people accountable for how money has been spent, the story has been hushed up. I remember a story, was it last year, a couple of years back, talking about how the, I believe it was the chief of army staff or, or the minister of defense, so, somebody like that, uh, some property in Dubai was traced to him or to his wife. And somehow that story just went away and nothing happened. The person in question was never probed. Nobody was ever held accountable. And no one ever asked the question that 
Well, if this person who is controlling a military budget uh, has property in Dubai, and the military budget he's controlling is not producing the results that we expect to see, then how isn't there a link between these two? Nobody asked that question, it just went away. And that's, that's again, that's a very, um, that's something that is very unique to the Buhari administration, I think, that there, there is this sort of, it's, uh, Nigeria has never been a place where people have been held accountable for, for starters, but under this particular administration, there has been a very brazen uh, bent to things that people can literally look you in the eyeballs and say, I'm going to do this, and you're not going to do anything about it. And that's that. And that's, it's very unfortunate. And that's what people like, uh, people like myself in the media and in the civil society space have been trying to tackle that this, uh, this idea that this sort of like uh, almost a butcher-esque uh, impunity needs to be nipped in the bud because at the end of the day, we are still a, a democracy. So if we are a democracy, then we have to run like a democracy. We have to be able to ask questions. And we have to be able to follow up when these questions are asked. Currently, these questions are not being asked enough, I don't think. And when they're asked, they're not being followed up. So yes, uh, to an extent, Nigeria does have a severe accountability issue, which, if addressed, would go some way toward addressing at least the very worst parts of insecurity. And as, uh, as Leonard said, it would help to restore at least a semblance of normalcy. But we mustn't forget that that's only a semblance. It's really, it's really just a semblance. Nigeria, before 2009, when the insecurity we know started off in earnest, was not a particularly peaceful country either. So the problem still goes back to what I, what I keep on saying is, is that structurally, the economic structure of Nigeria is not favorable. We, we started hearing of Boko Haram and all these like, groups 2009, 2010, because of the publicity that they achieved. But prior to that time, there has always been large scale insecurity in parts of the north. We just didn't hear about it. You know, people going around slaughtering villages, that didn't start in 2014 or 2015. That was going on for decades. I, so last year, I, I, was, I was part of a team that wrote a report that was presented to the US Vice President. And we examined 20 years of data going from the 1990s to the mid noughties and there was a constant pattern of these killings. They have been going on for decades. They just weren't getting any airtime at all. It wasn't covered in the media. And when it was, you would just say, oh, it's the, it's the communal clash. And that's it. What changed between then and now is that now everybody has something called a smartphone. Everyone can take pictures. Everyone can tell their story now. So now it's obvious that, OK, there is something going on that we didn't know about before. That's what gives us the impression that, oh, wow, there's this thing, it's not new. It's been happening for decades. So yes, we, we do need to address the uh, accountability problem specifically within the, the Nigerian security establishment. The funds that are budgeted anemic as they are are not being addressed. But we still have to keep that wider uh, view of things that the systemic problems in Nigeria did not start in 2009. And they're not going to end if we, if we magically do sort of push a button marked end corruption. That's not going to, on its own, it's not going to solve the problem. It will solve a part of the problem, but it's not the whole solution in itself. All right, thank you. So I, I have this question I want to ask Mr. Dennis, and it's regarding DSS. So there was this report by Punch in 2019, last year, um, titled Untold Stories of Missing Persons Found in DSS Custody. So, yes, we keep talking about security crisis in the country and how people are missing, we don't know where they are, they're still that the data that we don't know where he is. As a former um, director, assistant director at DSS, what can you say to things like this and what DSS does? What was the headline again? The headline is Untold Stories of Missing Persons Found in DSS Custody. So it just highlighted people that went missing, they got picked up without any arrest warrant or anything like that. And three, four years later, someone meets the person in DSS custody, comes back home and says, your daughter actually saw him in DSS custody. Which year was this? Is this a, it was 2019. The report was 2019. I'm going to post the link right here. I don't agree with that report at all. <laughs> uh, because um, yeah, right from uh, 1990, was it 92 when we uh, have Babangida coming to power? 
Is it 92? Where was that? I, I can't remember. But when Babangida came into power, there was uh, the LSO at that time was actually uh, doing certain things that I guess you were right. And when Babangida came, he opened up all their cells. And a lot of people that were there, of course, there are people who know that they were there, were released. There is no way the DSS will arrest people, pick them up on the streets, and then keep them without anybody hearing about them, or not take them to court or something like that. I, I don't think that is the service that uh, uh, we have right now. Uh, because I know that, in fact, there was this uh, reorientation that came up after we moved from uh, the military regime of uh, Abacha, after Abacha died, to the civilian regime of, uh, starting with Obasa job, there was a big reorientation, you know, uh, pro process that went on to reorient people from the military idea to democratic ideas. You know, because again, I can tell you one basic fundamental issue is that the SSS, even the police, were, uh, they were all created to protect the regime in power. That's one thing many Nigerians don't understand. They were, they are for regime protection. And that's why people like me who have retired have tried to see if we can get some bills out there to amend the Constitution, where the security service will not be reporting to the president. It is a department, Department of State Services, DSS. It's a department of the presidency. We don't want it like that. Because that way, if the president goes against the national interest or commits a crime, you cannot arrest him because he's your boss. But if it's an independent body, then he can be questioned, just like what you have in the United States, where the FBI uh, under, uh, set up a Mueller commission, which was uh, investigating Donald Trump, a sitting president. But you can't do that in Nigeria because our laws are not designed like that. So um, I think more or less the service is an intelligence service. The period when they can pick up people and then of course harass them for all kinds of things are past, not these days anymore. All right, thank you, sir. So Khadija, over to you. Yes, you're back. Thank you so much for that, Dapo. Sorry for the break in transmission. Coincidentally, I had security issues with my computer. So uh, I, I want us, I would like us to address um, very quickly um, two states in Nigeria are gearing up for gubernatorial elections uh, next month and, and the month after Edo State and Ondo State. And um, I, I would like to pose this question to Leonard. Um, at this point in time, what should we be doing differently? What steps should we be taking to safeguard the electoral process and prevent a repeat of you know, the large scale unrest we saw in some of the other states that competed elections late last year, like Kogi and Bayelsa? So, um, I've been in the field before, and I can speak to this, but don't be shocked by what I'm going to say next. Violence on election day in Nigeria really over overstate. When people say, why ask yourself? In how many words were there violence? When you get to the words, you ask how many polling units? There has been no election where you had violence in, let's say, 40 polling units, which is essentially about three or four words. Okay. But it's just that 
the few places, pockets where these riffraffs misbehave, get a lot of air time. And the ripple effect of that is voter apathy, suppresses voter suppression. So a lot of people out of fear and anxiety, they don't turn out to vote. And that's the antiques of the politician. That's what they want to achieve. Um, so again, this one goes to responsible citizenry. You cannot rig an election in a polling unit where you are not popular. That's a fact. You can only rig an election where you are popular. The new electoral guidelines makes it even much more difficult, such that if you insist that the process must be adhered to where the, the, the card, the, the, the PVC is scanned, and then one, one piece of voter uh, ballot paper is issued, and then the person votes. Once you insist that this is the process on the polling unit, that's exactly what's going to happen. People are just unnecessarily afraid of elections. Uh, I left my job for one year just to be part of that process to understand it. And guess what? In my own polling unit, against the wishes of the big parties, we stood there and we defeated them soundly. And this can be done in every single polling unit if the people of that community simply just decide it is our election, it will be free, it will be fair. No riffraff will come to a community that has decided to have a free and fair election. I call on the people of Edo State, the people of Undo State, to take a decision that they are going to turn up on election day. They are going to turn up to vote in a free and fair manner. When they do these two things, there will be no brigandage happening around. The youths, the few youths that they will mobilize to cause mayhem, they will not come to a community that is organized to vote. You see, people make politicians look like they are superstars, like they have their eyes everywhere, that they are one big thing. We tested that scenario. We left and we said, hey, let us test the scenario that this certain senator that is so big and powerful is, is as big as powerful as they say he is. And we discovered to the contrary that when you are able to mobilize the people, the popular candidate always wins. It is when the election is very close and popularity is not clear, then any tiny bit of rigging will tilt the scale um, and, and have some kind of result. But in my experience, it, it doesn't have significant results. But I want to make one more comment on something that David said earlier. You see, again, because my background is in economics, I, I, I try to avoid certain numbers. Nigeria is a poor country, no doubt. But when, like David said, if our resources are utilized at 100%, Nigeria will not be a poor country. It means that the rate of growth of GDP will be double digits growing far faster than our population, which is our population is growing at 3%. Uh, that's death rate minus death rate. The balance is 3%. Population then becomes an asset because that's what China has. That's what India has. Homegrown companies will become, just by selling to Nigerians, become companies with huge revenue base. When you deal with insecurity, people will go to the farms. Foreign direct investment will find Nigeria attractive because we have population, you know. So when you run this country efficiently, we transform immediately from being a poor country with low growth to a country with very, very high growth potential. I work with a few multinational companies around and nowhere was our business growing as fast as it grows in Nigeria. I currently lead a business. Oh, Leonard, that Leonard, so sorry, so sorry to jump in. You know, especially on this um, topic of business, which which you just um, highlighted, David and yes. Mr. Amakri, I will come to you both shortly. You know, on your final thoughts on um, 
the security restructuring conversation. And I want to encourage members of the audience to please drop your answers in the question and answer box. It's right there um, at the bottom banner of your screen, um, the chat dialogue box. Please drop your answers there if you have any. Ade Olua, Ade Bayo, I see you have your hands up. If you have a question, please drop it in the question and answer box and we'll take that before um, we close out this conversation. Now, coming back to you, um, Leonard, I know that um, your business focus is in the agricultural sector. And one of the major challenges that that sector has faced is, um, is security, you know, as opposed to um, value chain operations, which you, you know, you will think, but you've been focused more on security in order to be able to, you know, um, do viable business. Tying this into the uh, security restructuring conversation and considering that agriculture, you know, constitutes about 20% of Nigeria's GDP. What would be the effect of security restructuring on new businesses such as yours that are directly, you know, threatened by the security situation in Nigeria? Actually, thank you. Uh, the shocking part was that when we were developing the business model, we the security wasn't part of our key constraints. We, we didn't see it. We we're talking about logistics. We we're talking about location. We we're talking about talent. We we're talking about partnerships, commercial partnerships and financing. We didn't see security, insecurity as a big issue until we started. And then it became central to our survival. It became an existential threat to us. I made um, advances. Uh, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture at the time, uh, Aldo Ogbe, I, I went to see him personally on two occasions, and I saw a few of his directors on many other occasions after that. And we were able to make our presentations to him. He shared with us what was the plan at the time. And the plan at the time was that the government was going to set up a core made up mainly of the NSCDC, the civil defense people, who will be tasked with the protection of high value commercial concerns in and around Nigeria. And the plan was that we we're going to get some of these officers um, you know, to work with us and, and reduce our cost of providing, because we had vigilantes, we we're pro providing mobilization to SARS and all of that. We we're working with members of the military and it was a lot of cost. And they promised that they, they already had a plan to do that for large commercial concerns just so that they can continue producing, particularly commercial concerns that are also running on government financing arrangements, right? Um, but that didn't happen. We got letters to this effect, telling us exactly what they have promised us, and it, it never happened. And so this is why um, I keep saying, right, that the first step to getting it done is actually somebody getting up and getting it done. It's not about sitting and strategizing. It's not about going back to say what happened, what can we do now? We start doing what we can do now, which is get the farms secure, get the areas that are strategic to us, our development secure first. Then we now say, okay, what else can we do to make sure that we reduce the number of poor people so that the risk of insecurity disappears over a 10, 15, 20 year period. But if we are not going to do something right now that can be done right now, it will work. So the conversation on restructuring must be approached at the village level, the community level. If you allow the community, if you empower, and by empowering the community, I mean the community being able to address security challenges. If they need to have guns, so be it. If you need to have do community policing where somebody is authorized to recruit locally, and form police locally and have the communities pay for that security policing structure from some form of federal government support, so be it. But people need to be able at the local level to protect themselves and their assets. And businesses like ours would then support them, would then, would then make overtures at them to, 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 to help our business grow. But now as it is, everything is centralized. It's too far from the people. There is no will. Where there is a will, it is a will actually to subvert the process. And this is, this is my candid belief. Thank you so much, Leonard. So, I mean, now we're pressed for time. But then coming back to you, David, um, we do have to highlight the role of the media 
in all of this. We spoke earlier about the culture of trust and you know, public participation um, in the security sector. And you know, media is largely responsible for our public consumption of the news. Um, and that's you, <laughs> David. You know, our panic, our anger, our whatever action we take or our resignations to the fates, it's all driven by those headlines, those photos, the posts, the tweets that we see on traditional as well as digital media. You know, cases in point um, recently, especially with the spike of um, gender-based violence with Uwa, Baraka, Tina, and all those hashtags that were uh, trending. Why has, uh, why do you think the government has not, um, has failed to embrace media, new media particularly in directing and, you know, reshaping the narrative, especially with a sensitive sector, a sector as sensitive as security? You know, I'm hoping that this line of thought will shape your um, final contributions to the conversation. So clearly, um, the government sees the free media space. And by free media space, I'm not just referring to traditional media. I'm also referring to social media. The government of Nigeria is still structured according to that of the military government, unfortunately. The, we returned to democracy in 1999, but the structure of Nigerian government fundamentally is still structured in a dictatorial way. So the government primarily sees the media as an adversary to either to be fought or to be controlled. The, media, the government does not see the media as an equal stakeholder in the national project. It doesn't, it doesn't see us as that. It sees us as enemies. So we're either there either to be counteracted or to be controlled. Counteracted either by putting out its own competing narrative. So the media reports something, and then you have, you have, the, you have the one that comes out and says, hey, no, it's not true, it's fake news. And whereas you're actually the one who's lying. But since they're constantly accusing the media of lying, people start to believe that the media is actually lying, whereas you are the one who's lying. So that you make us your enemy, or you you have your own army of sort of like uh, people who seed the media with their with your own narratives, as the current administration does, using something called the Buhari Center. It's a full more than two hundred employees, you know, people who work day and night. They they call into radio stations, they write up ads, they put out social media posts on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and all they do is just send out propaganda messages day and night to try and influence people's minds to believe things that are not necessarily true and to compete with the media you know that's what the government of nigeria is doing or to control the media in terms of using financial capacity of the government to induce the media to not do its job so i was telling someone the other day that part of the reason why i don't make it a habit to criticize my colleagues who don't do, who don't do the type of like investigative journalism that I do is because the journalism model in Nigeria is economically threatened. And what I mean by that is that the largest advertising spender in Nigeria, and as, as I'm sure you're aware, the, the business model of, of journalism and media in Nigeria is based on ad revenue. The biggest ad spender in Nigeria is, is still the government, unfortunately. So whether it's the print media or broadcast media, TV, radio, it's the government. Unfortunately, that spends the most on advertisements, which means, whether you like it or not, that the government still exerts a vice grip over what, you know, majority of what can get out in the media. So it's only a few people who are, who are independent, who both, you know, financially and the platform gives them the freedom to do what they want to do, like me, who are just a very small minority, who are actually able to do what I... What I refer to as real journalism, actual journalism, not merely sending out announcements and you know reporting news. Actually, David, thank you so much, Mr. Amakri. I'm I'm coming to you now. So um, you know, back to the earlier point that you made about intelligence gathering. I've been briefly in in you know under two minutes. What is the future for um, the digitization of Nigeria's security infrastructure, particularly with, you know, regards intelligence gathering? Because at the moment, it seems compared to their private sector um, counterparts, the national security infrastructure seems to be suffering uh, technological setbacks, particularly due to the dearth of unavailable data. 
what is the future? What are the innovative techniques that we could employ to improve our, you know, um, culture, information gathering culture? I think uh, what we should do is uh, a collaborative effort between the private sector security and the government security agents. And then, just like it is done in some countries, we should have information hubs where there are representatives of all the security agents, including private security. I'm mentioning private security because that is one big body that we have overlooked. They are everywhere. They are everywhere. The military, the police, even the SSS are not up to one million. But private security in this country last year, there were about two billion of them. And they are everywhere. So why can't we galvanize this particular group? You know, synergize with them, provide communications, and then of course, create a fusion center, not only one, fusion centers in all over the country, where there are representatives, and then the information from the field will be supplied, you know, into that fusion center, which is going to be uh, uh, assessed and then uh, they get intelligence out of it. Because this is how it works. The conversion of information into intelligence, which is actionable uh, for national development. I think that's, that's something we can try. And that's something that, of course, myself and some other people are suggesting to government. Thank you so much, Mr. Amaki. There you have it. You know, this has been a very interesting conversation for me. Um, the major highlights, I mean, if you joined later on, or I mean, even if they're just little points you pick from this entire conversation, it's, you know, important things like security is a collective responsibility. It's not something that is within the sole prerogative of the federal or state governments or experts or consultants or special assistants or whatever other appellation we call them. It's something that we're all individually responsible for. Um, collaboration with, uh, through public private sector partnerships is key. And um, we, government, of course, has to improve its communication techniques as well as enhance individual participation. So, I mean, the fact that you're here is the first step in the right direction, right? Um, please continue, uh, keep the conversations going, ask questions, reach out to your representatives in the executive, in the legislature. There are open source websites, just do your research. The information is there, it's available to you. Hold these people accountable because it's only when we begin to take a stand that you see uh, you know, any sort of results in our security governance structure. So. Um, this has been the August edition of Thursday Talks brought to you by Why Niger and Future Projects in collaboration with Enough is Enough EI in Nigeria and Budget. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I'll hand over to Dapo at, at this point to you know, bring it all to a close. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Khadija, for moderating. Thank you to Mr. Dennis. Thank you to, to Leonard, and thank you to um, our last panelist who has gone, I guess maybe network knocked him out as well. We are grateful. This holds every month. The last Thursday of every month, we have Thursday talks. And then um, next month, budget will be leading this conversation. So please and please don't miss it. Um, if you have feedback to give us, please just send us a mail. Um, Thursday talks at eingria.org. We'll get your mail and we'll reply to you. So thank you. Um, if you are from Edo, um, and um, what other state is that? So you are from both states holding elections. Please and please go out and vote. Um, like Ms. Elena tried to say, um, when we are not many, when we don't come out, then we can give these politicians the opportunity to do what they want to do. So please and please go out and vote. Protect your vote as well. We need to be involved. We need to be very active. So thank you so much once again. See you next month. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye.